Blessed be the rock. Blessed be the rock of my salvation. Oh Blessed be the rock. Blessed be the rock of my salvation. Oh magnify the Lord. Oh magnify the Lord. For he is worthy to be praised. I want you to sing it like he's worthy, okay? Oh magnify the Lord. Praise you, Jesus. For he is worthy to be praised. Hosanna. Blessed be the rock. Blessed be the rock of my salvation. Hosanna. Blessed be the rock. Blessed be the rock of my salvation. Hosanna. Blessed be the rock. Hosanna. Blessed be the rock. Blessed be the rock of my salvation. Hosanna. Blessed be the rock. Blessed be the rock of my salvation. We praise the Lord. Hallelujah. We lift up your name, Jesus, so all men can be drawn unto it. Glory to God. Well, where's our next song? Um, how about, um, what a mighty God we serve. Amen. Let me, let me say something. Now, you guys can rock better than this. I know. That's right. <laughs> I know we used to do it. So, okay. <laughs> this time, let's do it for Jesus. Right. right. It's okay that we don't have music. That's right. You know, we don't need music, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm talking about church folks. See? You know, I was talking about something else. <laughs> um... What a mighty God we serve. Which one is it? Oh, oh Lord, how majestic is your name. I'm sorry. Didn't? Yeah, how majestic is your name. That's the one. Yeah. Okay. You guys know this one. Oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Oh Lord, our Lord. Okay, now we're going to sing it like he's majestic. And you guys are blessed. I can look at you and see. Pastor. He said, why don't you just run them through with this real quick. Okay. Those who don't, they can just come right sure. Okay. Okay, we'll go. Just, uh, just loosen up. We're going to sing this morning, okay? I want everybody to loosen up and praise the Lord, and we are going to have a good time praising Him. Amen? Okay, here we go. Oh Lord, our oh Lord, how majestic is your name in all of the earth. Oh Lord, our oh Lord, how majestic is your name in all of the earth. Oh Lord, we praise your name. Oh Lord, we magnify your name, Prince of Peace, Mighty God, oh Lord God Almighty. Okay, you know this, right? Okay, praise the Lord. Oh Lord, oh Lord, how majestic is your name in all of the earth. Oh Lord, oh Lord, how majestic is your name in all of the earth. Oh Lord, we praise your name. Oh Lord, we magnify your name, Prince of Peace, Mighty God, oh Lord God Almighty. You ready? We're going to sing it again. Praise the Lord. Oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all of the earth. Oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all of the earth. Oh Lord, we praise your name. Oh Lord, we magnify your name. Prince of Peace, mighty God, oh Lord God Almighty. One more time. Oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all of the earth. Oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all of the earth. Oh Lord, we praise your name. Oh Lord, we magnify your name. Prince of peace, mighty God, oh Lord God Almighty. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Well, I know you guys love the Lord. And we're going to slow it down just a little bit. Just give your spirits a chance to quiet down. And we're just going to meditate on the love of God. 
I know he loves everybody. He died for everybody. I see all these happy faces and you've experienced his love. Amen. Praise the Lord. You guys know the song? I love you. I love you. I love you, Lord, today because you cared for me in such a special way. And yes, I praise you. I lift you up. I magnify your name. That's why my heart is filled with praise. You know that song? The second, <laughs> Amen. the second verse is, My heart, my soul, my mind belongs to you. You paid the price for me way back on Calvary. And yes, I praise you. I lift you up. I magnify your name. That's why my heart is filled with praise. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, we're just going to quiet our spirits and just concentrate on Jesus and who he is and who he is in our lives and what he's done for us and just sing this song. Amen. Praise the Lord. I love you. I love you. I love you, Lord, today because you care for me in such a special way. And yes, I praise you, I lift you up, I magnify your name. That's why my heart is filled with praise. Let's sing that verse once again. I love you, I love you, I love you, Lord, today. Because you cared for me in such a special way. And yes, I praise you. I lift you up. I magnify your name. That's why my heart is filled with praise. Now we'll go to the second verse. My heart, my soul, my mind. My heart. My soul, my mind belongs to you. You pay the price for me way back on Calvary. And yes, I praise you. I lift you up. I magnify your name. That's why my heart is filled with praise. We'll sing that verse again. My heart, my soul, my mind belongs to you. You pay the price for me way back on Calvary. And yes, I praise you. I lift you up. I magnify your name. That's why my heart is filled with praise. I love you, I love you. I love you, I love you. I love you, Lord, today. Because you care for me in such a special way. And yes, I praise you. I lift you up. I magnify your name. That's why my heart is filled with praise. Let's sing that verse once again. I love you. I love you. I love you, Lord, today. Because you care for me in such a special way. And yes, I praise you, I lift you up, I magnify your name. That's why my heart is filled with praise. That's why my heart is filled with praise. Praise the Lord. That's why my heart is filled with praise. That's why my heart is filled with praise. That's why my heart is filled with praise. Praise you, Jesus. Well, we have one more song to say I love you to Jesus. Let's go Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus.
You're such a mighty and worthy God. Thank you, Lord. They're almost similar. And if you don't know, it's really easy to learn. You guys know this song, you know. I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to worship you. Oh, my soul, rejoice. Take joy, my King, what you hear. Amen. Let it be a sweet sound in your ear. Praise the Lord. I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to worship you. Oh, my soul, rejoice. Take joy, my King, in what you hear. Let it be a sweet, sweet sound in your ear. Let's sing it again, and we're just going to sing it slow and soft. I love you. I'm sorry. I love you, Lord. And I lift my voice to worship you, oh my soul, rejoice, take joy, my King, in what you hear and let it be a sweet sweet sound in your ear we'll sing it one more time before we just fade into bless the Lord on my soul I love you Lord and I lift my voice To worship you, oh my soul, rejoice, take joy, my King, in what you hear, and let it be a sweet sweet sound in your ear. Now we're just going to sing, bless the Lord, oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his Let's just sing it for my spirits this morning. Amen. Praise the Lord. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. One more time. Bless the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. One more time with I love you, Lord. Praise you, Jesus. I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to worship you, oh my soul, rejoice. Take joy, my King, in what you hear, and 
Let it be a sweet, sweet sound in your ear. Let it be a sweet, sweet sound. And let it be a sweet, sweet sound in your ear. One more time. Let it be a sweet, sweet sound. Let it be a sweet, sweet sound in your ears. Praise the Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you. I know some some of my friends and even some of my uh, family are saying, Boy, we're really ex excited that you're going to start your church today. And I have to make a correction. This is our fellowship. As Eugene very appropriately put, there's only one church, and the only person that can lay claim to the church is the one who has the nail prints in his wrist Amen. and the sword print in his side. And I want Ladera Christian Fellowship to have that kind of foundation, that we are just workers with Christ. If you're here and you, we really don't have a membership, obviously, this is our first service, but if you're here and you're worshiping with us and you're part of the body of Christ, then you're part of the church. If you're here with us, and some of you are, and you're not a Christian, you are welcome. Christians, you know what? It's time for us to reach out to people in the world, isn't it? God is not just concerned about us. As a matter of fact, He already has us. He's reaching out for others who haven't come to the knowledge of Christ. Some very good people. I'm not going to put anybody on the spot, but I'm thinking of one in particular. A very good friend of mine. And I'm hoping what he sees today in me and in us is the love of Jesus Christ. Sometimes you can't persuade people with words, but you can persuade them with love. So I just want to acknowledge uh, the Taylor family who've been very, very helpful in getting this started. The Roseanne family and Mr. Joe who took in a plane just to be here this morning. I mean, that's, that's what it's all about. And it's an honor and a privilege to have those kind of people. The Coleman's who are here, who have been a lot of support. Kevin is like my ear at my office. I just run everything by him. Sometimes, you have to learn how to tell me when you have to get to work, okay? Sometimes we, I start talking to Kevin. We're there for 45 minutes. And Lisa, of course, and everybody that's here, everybody, we're just grateful that you're here, and we hope that you'll get something out of the service today. Also, I, I, I don't, I don't want to miss anybody, but... I do want to say I was really pleased this morning. Brian Allen called me and said, I want to pray with you this morning before you get started. And we sat right out here in the, in the hallway and prayed. So I thank you for that, Brian. Before we get started, I'm going to ask Joe to lead us in a word of prayer. We're going to get into the word, and then we're going to have an invitation, and we're going to take a few minutes and just kind of explain what the Derek Christian Fellowship is all about. Joe? Good morning. Good morning. Um, some of you know I, I, I flew in this morning, and, and the reason why I mention that is, is not to, to brag that I flew in this morning. I've got to go back to San Diego this afternoon, but uh, the reason why I did is because I'm committed. I'm not committed to Charlton, but I'm committed to this fellowship. And uh, that's the important thing I think the basis of this fellowship would be is that we're not committed to one person, we're committed to each other. So on that note, you know, when I first came, I said, well, shoot, I'm flying off this plane, I'm in my jeans and the shirt, and I said, well, First thing I'll do is apologize for our appearance, but you got to understand, God doesn't care how you dress. He doesn't care what color you are, or how you wear your hair, uh, or if you're old or if you're young. And that's the thing I think we really have to understand. Whether you come in jeans or whether you come in a suit, you come as you are. God sees you for what you are, not what you wear. The other thing is I'm glad that the, the focus of the, the message today is not on fasting, because for those of you who walk by that, <laughs> that layout out there, uh, that, that has to be a sincere challenge. You know, um, I was, I just got to share this with you one second. Excuse me. We're going to talk about absent mindedness too. <laughs> but you know, uh, Charles and I, we, I bought Charles one of these, and I have one. It's a little dictionary. And, uh, it's interesting about something that may not necessarily be something that's scriptural in nature out of the Bible, but, uh, you know, if you use this, it's very interesting what you can find about words. One of the words that I looked this morning 
I was on the plane was start. Or just the word start, something so basic as start. And I pushed the definition, and I looked through there, and I saw a couple, you know, okay, go on, go on. And then this one that really hit me, it said the first part. The first part. You think about that. We're not finished. We're just starting. And it's just like uh, some of you all have heard the analogy about a race. But when you get in the blocks, for those who have been involved in track, you get in the blocks and you start the race, and you don't even finish the race that day. But you got another race to prepare for each and every day. And I think that's the focus that we have to look on. Lastly, um, balance. And I'm certainly not going to deliver our pastor's message this morning. But you know what I thought about balance? Have you seen people that have been handicapped and have to have the boot shoe? Have you seen them before? And you know, well, why do they wear the boot shoe? They're off balance. They're off balance. Well, the word of God should be like that boot shoe. It's to level us out. And that's what's missing in the church today. And that's what we see this church as being as a balance. Somewhere where you can walk evenly. Not perfectly, but evenly. So on that note, I'd like everybody to stand a minute, please. And we're going to bow our heads. And we bow our heads not to look at the ground, but to humble ourselves to the Lord out of respect. Thank you, Father. Father, as we assemble here this morning, Father, we want to thank you for the start. Father, this is a vision that we've had for, for quite a while. Father, as we go before you this morning, may your spirit be alive and well, Father. May he move through this room this morning, Father, as you wish him to move. May the words that utter through our pastor's lips this morning, Father, be the true word of God and nothing else. Father, may your word go out to each and every one of us, to, the, to those who are your children in Christ already, and to those who are contemplating this new family that they're about to enter, Father. We look for them to join us, Father. Father, we're not looking for great numbers next week or the following week, Father, for you know the pattern and the timetable for us. But, Father, we humble ourselves to you this morning. We ask you for your grace. We ask you for your, for your divine word and that it will minister to each and every one of us and that we will have a love amongst each other, Father, that doesn't see different pictures and how people look, Father, but just true, true agape love. Father, we just thank you for this ministry. We thank you, Father, that it's going to be a stable, stable foundation like the statues that have been erected, Father. So we just thank you, Father, for our pastor and his family, that he truly will be a dedicated fixture to this assembly and that he will be a part of the Dare Christian Fellowship for as long as this particular life is, Father. In Jesus' name we thank you. Amen. How many of you in here are bashful? Who's bashful? I'll be honest with you. If you don't, Raise your hand, I'm gonna call you up and have you do something. Who's that? Okay. One of the things that the church should do, and I'm not into the message yet, people need to, to feel comfortable around one another. One of the ways you can do that is by having a conversation with someone. Another way you can do it is by praying with someone. And the church that Lori and I just left, we do this on a regular basis, and I think it what it does, it gives people the opportunity to meet one another. It gives people the opportunity to be able to share some of their needs. And that has been a blessing, has been I mean, for the past 10 years, or off and on in the past 10 years, when we get together with people and pray for them and with them. So we're going to do that in a moment. Now here's the, here's the ground rule. Let's say you're a bachelor and you've never done this before. In a few minutes, a few minutes I'm going to have you stand up, get in circles of about two or three, and even if it's just saying who you are and, you know, that you're glad to be here or if you have a need, I want you to express that need. We're going to take about five minutes to do it. I'm not going to lead us. I'm just going to have you stand in a moment. If you're bashful, say I'm bashful. I've never done this before. But simply all you have to really do is say my name, like for example, let's say Kevin and I were in the same circle. My name is Charles. What's your name? Kevin, great. Uh, how you doing? Fine. Do you have any prayer requests? Yes, I do. I want to pray for such and such and such. Okay, I'll pray with you. Charles, do you have any prayer requests? Yes, I do. I want to pray for the Derek Christian Fellowship. Okay, we'll do that. Then you can hold hands. You don't have to. You can sit down, take about a few minutes, and just ask the Lord to honor those prayers that you're about to make. So is everybody ready to do it? Come on, let's see your hands. Yeah. You know you're not. You know yes, you are. Okay, so I'm going to have you stand. Let's do this formally. Okay. And get in circles of about two or three. Introduce yourself. Never, never done it before. Just say that. Not just somebody you know. I yeah, right. Not just somebody you know. As a matter of fact, go around and say, we're small. Excuse me. Excuse me. We want to pray. Would you join us in our
progress record, please? Sure. Hi, <laughs> hey, Uncle Larry. Okay, turn the camera off for a second. <laughs> Just while the others are praying, if you want to just kind of express the prayers. Okay. Did everybody bring Bibles? Who doesn't have a Bible? Very important. If you don't have a Bible and, and you're not sitting next to someone, please find someone that does. I want to set a precedent before I start teaching. I really don't know anything of myself. I don't really think my opinion is important. Actually, I don't think anyone's opinion is important. And certainly not mine. Everything that I believe and everything that I teach and will believe and will teach, I have to be able to find through the scriptures. We're going to be looking at the scriptures a lot. The scriptures are God's word. This is God's word to us as if he were to write us a letter. And so... When you're here, if you have a Bible, bring it. Because you want to want to check out what I'm saying. What if I'm telling you something that's not true? You want to be able to check things out for yourself. So I'm going to have another quick word of prayer, and then I'm going to get started if you join with me. Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, we know that your word is alive. Father, we know that your word always accomplishes what you please. It, is, it always prospers where you send it. I ask you, Lord, to use me to teach your words. I ask you, Lord, that I would decrease and you would increase. I thank you, Lord, that those that are listening this morning will look at the word and they will take notes and they will go home and they will search the scriptures for themselves to see if what I'm saying is really true. And I thank you that that will be the foundation of the teaching here at the Dare Christian Fellowship. And so, Father, we give you praise for giving us all insight this morning. In your word, we praise you and thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So, if you haven't asked the question already, the question that comes to your mind, why another ministry? Why another church fellowship? Well, first of all, let's talk about some of the reasons why we may not need any more ministry, a church fellowship. We certainly don't need them in terms of that there is a lack of numbers, right? I mean, if we were to get in the car, within 20 minutes, I could show you 40 churches in this area. So it's not like we need another ministry or another fellowship because we don't have any. As a matter of fact, there's one very close to us. If we could pull a drill, if we could drill a hole through the floor, we'd fall right into it. Because there's another church that meets downstairs every Sunday. So it's not like we need another ministry because of the fact that we don't have it. We need another ministry and another fellowship for many important reasons. And I want to share that with you as we look at God's Word together. First reason why we should have another ministry or why another ministry, because the world is in a crisis. Would you agree with me? Yes. And by the way, you can talk back to me. You don't have to say amen. You can say amen. You can say yes. You can even say, no, I don't agree. And I'll try to clarify. Now, if it takes more than a minute, then I'll just say, see me afterwards for the sake of everybody else. But the world is in crisis. You know, I was watching a program, and I know the Lord just had me to see this. We were getting ready to go to a concert last night, and I was getting ready, and the news was on. And the Lord let me hear this statistic, and I know He let me hear it for this morning. In the United States, we find that 23,000 people are murdered every year here in the United States. Sounds like a crisis to me. I figured that out. I divided that into 365. 60 people are murdered every single day. Now, it may not get us close to home because it hasn't happened to us or someone we love, but it recently hit me close to home, not from a family member or a friend, but how many of you heard of this woman who was shot a couple of weeks ago in Northridge? She was, uh, she was robbed. They asked her for her purse, and she gave them their, her purse. Matter of fact, it was the LA Times a couple of days. And here, she did everything that they asked, and they shot her in front of her nine-year-old son. It sounds like a crisis to me. It's a, it's a real crisis when you count all of the burglaries, the rapes, all of the extortion. The world is in trouble. 
They're in a crisis, and part of the reason why they're in a crisis is because they're Christless. That's why the world is in crisis. There's no Christ. I'm going to even talk about today that the church is in a crisis. Amen. And they do have Christ. <laughs> Christianity is in crisis. But I want to share with you some scriptures that kind of show us what the Bible says about this crisis that the world is going to be in at the end time. So if you look with me to the book of 2 Timothy. If you don't know me already, I really like to teach the scriptures. The scriptures are where the answers are. I don't have the answers, but the scriptures do. And Paul is writing to his, I guess his protege, his young protege who's going into the ministry. And he's giving him some instructions about what's going to happen in the end times. And so he tells Timothy in the first verse, in the third chapter, This know also, Timothy, that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own self. Do we see that today? Yes. Well, what does that mean? Anybody want to take a stand? I'm going to say men are lovers of their own self. What? Just they kind of lovers of themselves and not consider it or think about it. That's right. Men will be lovers of their own selves. Covetous. We have any of that going around. That's what the whole 80s we're about. You've got one man who almost bankrupts several companies for his own greed. It was all spawned by greed. The man made $1.1 billion in one year. It was all because of greed. Rose in crisis. Covetous. I mean, when is enough enough? It seems like to me, after you have $5, $10 million, you really don't need any more money, do you? So why did he have to have... And it's not like he was trying to get $1 billion. He was making $1 billion in one year. I mean, if I make... If I ever get $15 million in my lifetime, I'd forget working just do this all the time. So there's covetousness. Boasters. Got any of that today? You ever heard rap music? Yeah, and I'm riding in my Benzo and there's Lorenzo. <laughs> Check me out. I got a bankroll. It's all boasting, bragging. Proud. People are proud. Too proud for God. I don't mean that. People are... And I want you to be reading along with me. Blasphemers, disobedient to parents. Anybody have any of those problems? Or no any? I'm not talking about just the young children. I'm talking about older children. They're disobedient to their parents. And this is all this is almost like an epidemic. Unthankful. Unholy. Now, church, before you point at the world, the church isn't too holy. That's right. Amen. In some cases. Without natural affection, the kind of affection that you have that a parent has for a child or a child has for a parent. Let me ask you this. How do you kill your mother and father for money? Right. How do you do that? Right. I mean, and forget, let's say these gentlemen, you know who I'm talking about, yeah. right? They haven't been convicted. They're on trial. How could you just kill your mother and father, period? Right. And if their mother and father were doing to them what they said, how could you do that to your child? How could you use your child as a sex object for you? There's no natural affection to it. Truce breakers. That means those who do not keep covenants. You know, like a lot of us who've been married before. You know, oh, I'm getting too sensitive here. People just break covenants so easily. You know, marriage is a covenant. You, you knew that already, right? And what is the divorce rate today? like it's never been before. I think it's more than 70% of all marriages in the divorce today. So people are covenant breakers. They don't keep covenants. And as a matter of fact, in business, I'm in business. I mean, there was a time when you could just, what's your name? Turner. I, I could say, hey, Turner, let's do this and let's shake on it. And that was enough. Right. Could you do that today? No way. You can have a contract as long as this room. Right. And it's still broken. Because right. you can, as long as you can get an expensive enough attorney, he can get you out of it. So people are truce breakers. False accusers. Incontinent. It really means that continent are people who don't have any control. Uh, what else? What are some of the characteristics? Fierce. Now, you know what this word fierce means in the Greek? People are wild. That's some wild folks today. No? I mean, I mean, I have seen some things today like, have you ever been down to Melrose? Yes. <laughs> Just drive down Melrose. Folks, it's wild, man. 
I mean, I've seen people with their hair. You ever seen that where their hair is like shh, shh. <laughs> People are wild. Now, this is not judgment against them, if that's what they want to do. I, I don't think there's any sin, you know, in that by and of itself. But it's just folks are wild. So, they're despisers of those that are good. You try to stand for something that's good today. And watch how much opposition you get from the world. What else? Uh, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. Now that should be the epitaph over the world right now. If you lived on another planet and they had a little phrase for earth, it would say, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. Even Christians are like that to some extent. We want to have pleasure. We don't really love the giver, we love the gift. And God is looking for our love. See, because if God wanted to, He could turn the lights out. Right now. He could just say, it's over. And there's nothing you, you and I can do about it. So, let's keep going. Now, also, having a form of godliness, but, but denying the power of it. There's a lot of people today, and it, when it talks about the power of God, it's more of the authority. Have you ever watched the Grammys or something like that, where one of the most ranked people you know will get up there and say, yeah, yes, and God bless you, and, and thank God. And I'm saying, is this what God is all about? That's what the world system is in today. No, good Katie. That is all this Katie. She's not even two. She can see that. Let's look at Matthew chapter 24. There's some other characteristics here of the world being in crisis. Now, by the way, see, I, I, I'm going to get all, a whole lot of amens while I'm talking about the world being in crisis. I'm going to see how many amens I get when I talk about the church. See, in the church today, we're pointing the finger at the world. And the world has an excuse for their being in crisis. I'm going to tell you what it is in a moment. But I said, turn to Matthew chapter 24. And look at the... Uh, oh, let's start at verse 4. And Jesus said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. This is not the subject today. But if, I want you to highlight that verse in your Bible. I want you to go home and read it and read the context. Very important, but that's not the subject today. And you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise up against nation, kingdom against kingdoms, and there shall be famines. Have any of those? Terrible famines throughout the world. You can't turn on the television without someone making a push to help feed the hungry. And I think they're legitimate. You know, some people are taking advantage of it, but not everybody. There's some hungry people in Ethiopia, but not just in Ethiopia. Shoot, downtown Los Angeles. Just because it's not a third world, world nation, it doesn't mean that famine isn't famine. You know, little kids that live in Skid Row that don't eat for two or three days, what, what would you call that? Famine. <laughs> and that's what's happening in the world today. He also says that there will be a uh -oh, pestilence. How many of you have heard of the killer bees? They're on their way. Pestilence. And we all in California can relate to this one. Earthquakes in all types of places. Devastation. The world is in crisis. What does a crisis mean? Really, a crisis is a point where in anything where it's very crucial and critical. And nothing can teach. You can see that better than what's just happened last week. What happened in it? 6.4. How many people have already been killed? Confirmed it? How many? 16 to 60. 30,000 people in one swap. That sounds like a crisis to me. And see, Jesus warned about this crisis. He said this is going to happen. I, I like the way my friend, my friend Eugene put it. He says, Christians are too busy crying about why are all these things happening? Because God said that. Shouldn't surprise us. But the world is in crisis. And they're looking for someone to lead them out of the crisis. Guess who they're looking to? Or they should be able to look to. They should be able to look to you and me. But if I wasn't a Christian already, and I had to look at some Christians, I would not. That's probably the last thing I would want. And it shouldn't be that way. And this is not a rebuke against the church. This is more a time of encouraging us to make sure we are what we're supposed to be. You want to know what Jesus said we're supposed to be? Anybody want to know what he said? Matthew 5. Let's look at it. 
Let's see what Jesus said. We're supposed to do. And then, chapter 5. I want to be this. I want to be this first to my family. Everybody in my family is not born again. I want my family to see Jesus in me. My family is so supportive. My parents are out of town. That's why they're not here. And they called me and they were really supportive. And I appreciate it. I want my family to come to Jesus Christ. I mean, I, I like the support. But I want them to come to Christ. And I want them to see Christ in me. I have certain friends that I love as much as family, if not more than family. And I want them to come to Christ. It's not because I want to win the argument from the past several years or I want you to just follow me because I'm better than you, but I know what I have in Christ. You know what I have in Christ? The most important thing? Anybody want to guess? Salvation. Salvation. I have eternal life. If they close these eyes tonight and y'all bury me next Wednesday, I have, I'll have no problems. Can you say the same thing? See, and that's what the biggest crisis that everybody has, and we'll talk about that later. But in Matthew chapter 5, let's look at... Um, Verse 13. This is Jesus speaking to us, who are His disciples. He says, You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has lost its savor or flavor, how is the world going to be salted? It is thereafter good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under the foot of men. If you have salt and it doesn't have any flavor, what are you going to do with it? Ladies, First, you have a nice spice rack. If you have some spices and they lost them, or at least I thought you did. If you have everything else, no. Nah. <laughs> but don't you have a spice rack? I thought so. Okay, don't be messing with me, though. No. She's making me look bad. I'm up here thinking Chris has got a nice spice rack. Okay. When your spices start losing their flavor, what do you do to them? You're supposed to throw them away. You're supposed to throw them away. You won't cook with them. Anyway, you might keep them up there for show. I wonder if that's where the church is today. We are almost up here as a trophy. We're supposed to be the salt of the earth. He says in the next verse, You are the light of the world. You are the light of the world. How many of you have heard of this guy who teaches out of Dallas named Tony Evans? He has a great message that I've been hearing on the radio talking about Christians being the light of the world and the salt of the earth. And one day I was listening to it. He says, You are the light of the world. And I said, No, we're supposed to be the light of the world. And immediately the Lord corrected me. He says, no, you are the light of the world. The problem is you're dim. Too many Christians think we are the tail light. We're supposed to be the headlight. The world is supposed to be following us, and yet we are more influenced by the world than the world is influenced by us. We're following their lead. And really, deep down in their hearts, they're saying, would you please lead us properly? But we're not. Watch this, verse 14. You are the light of the world. The city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do men light a lamp and put it under a bushel, but on a lampstand, and it gives light unto all that are in the house. Let now, how many of you already know Christ as your Savior? You've already invited Christ into your life. Okay, this is not a suggestion that Christ is about to make. This is a command. He says this: Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. That's your assignment. If you were my class, I'd say this is your assignment for the week. Let your light so shine before men so that people can glorify God and see Jesus in you. Because for some people, they're not coming to a church. They're not going to pick up a Bible. The only Jesus they're going to see is the Jesus in you. Amen. And you've got to be that light. Let's look at uh, the next verse. Think not that, oh, excuse me, I'm sorry, I just want to close this 16th verse or close this particular passage. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. If your light is out, you won't be able to leave it. See, the world is in a crisis. Part of the reason why the world is in crisis is because the church is in a crisis. And if you don't think so, you just haven't been going to it. You haven't been listening to the news. You know, it amazes me that in 1993, the church is still trying to decide whether or not we should have people who have lifestyles that are contrary to the Scriptures as our leaders. Today, I mean, churches have meetings about this. Should we allow, and I'm not going to put anybody down as such, 
because if you're in that kind of lifestyle, you're down enough as it is. I don't need to tell you, you already know it. But they're saying, should we have these people who have a lifestyle that's contrary to the scripture, should we let them be leaders in the church? Let me ask you, does anybody know the answer to that question? That's a pretty easy question for me. I never had a meeting on that. The church is in trouble. The church is in trouble because we have churches today that their whole foundation is based upon racism. How many of you have heard of the Ku Klux Klan? They call themselves Christians. I'm, I'm ashamed to be identified with the Ku Klux Klan. No wonder many people in the world aren't following Christians. If these are Christians, you can have Christianity. Now, are Ku Klux Klan people Christians? Not if they hate the way they're supposed to. The church is in a crisis. And if I hear another story about a Catholic priest, or any kind of priest for that matter, uh, molesting a child, I, I don't know what I would do. All the time. See, a lot of people like to talk about this, but see, this is what's happening, and this is why the churches are not as effective as they could be. Amen. And nobody wants to talk about it. They say, let's be loving. Let's be Christian. I'm going to ask you this question. Can you be more loving than Jesus? What did Jesus do when he was here? He died. He died. What, what did he do? What did he say when he was here? He, when he saw something wrong, what did he do? He just said, well, I don't want to offend anyone. I just better be quiet. No, he went and, and he went and attacked it. Why do you think he attacked the Pharisees? Because he hated their guts and he was tired of them? He loved them. He wanted them to be corrected. And so he told them about themselves. How can we do any less? And lastly, I mean, the church is in a crisis when... You have to measure your spirituality by what you drive. Excuse me. Now, just think about that for a moment. What if I told you, I'm a strong Christian. I've got strong faith. You want me to prove it? Come with me out to the parking stall and I'll show you how I'm strong in faith. What does that have to do with spirituality? You know, when you watch television today, you can watch television, especially late at night, and you can see these, uh, I call them real estate evangelists. Anybody ever seen these guys? And they're all telling you how to make millions of dollars and what have you. And when I turn on some Christian programs, that don't see much difference. As a matter of fact, the majority of the programs that are on television today are not. I said the majority. I did not say all. There's a difference. There are some people out there that are teaching the gospel, and God is moving. But every time I turn on the TV, I can't tell the difference. Churches in crisis. Last, certainly not least, Christianity is in serious crisis. I want to give you bad news. God is moving in some people's lives. God is moving in some Christians' lives. But if you look at at least Christianity in America is in crisis. Now, Brother Christian, what do you base your belief on? Eugene, you're a Christian. What do you base your belief on? The Word of God. The Word of God. How many of you that are Christians already don't base what you believe on the Word of God? So we all do. We all say the Bible is what we base our belief on. And yet I've done surveys with Christians that the average Christian cannot give me one scripture for every year they've been a Christian. No wonder folks don't follow us. I was telling a friend last night, I, this is kind of like my mission in life. I was taking a class yesterday, and I'm taking a class on leadership because I guess I'm going to have to be a leader now. And if I'm lacking in anything, I don't think I'm a good leader, so I'm taking a class on it. And one of the things that they said, two key elements of a leader is he needs to know, know what his philosophy of life is, and I know that very well. And he has to know what is his mission in life. And I believe my mission in life is to arrest people's attention to the fact that this is not time for playing. <laughs> It's time for getting in this. This is a gold mine of information. It's because of this book. And what it what stands behind it is why I'm here. Why I believe I'm still alive. Because of what's in the scripture. And if you're a Christian too, you've got to get in the scripture. It's not so you can walk around and let every and quote scripture and show everybody how much of the Bible you know. But so that you can let your light shine. When Jesus said let your light shine, what kind of light is he talking about? the light of Him, His life. The Bible tells us that Christ left us an example that we should follow His steps. The Bible says that the greatest commandment is that we keep His commandments. Now how can you keep God's commandments if you don't know what they are? 
Let's look at the scripture, 2 Timothy, chapter 4. People who know me know that I you can't talk to me without me talking about this. And I understand why. By the way, I want to say this. We have a lot of things that we need to accomplish with Madeira. One, see all these beautiful children? Ain't they cute? <laughs> Especially mine today. He's really cute today. I mean, he hasn't been this cute in a long time. I'm being facetious. We hope to have nursery, not nursery service, but a place where we can leave the kids. We should in the next several weeks. And when I get to the end, see, I'm, I'm getting ready to hook you. I'm setting my bait right now. But I, I don't want to spoil it, so let me just get off of that. Okay, 2 Timothy chapter 4. Let's look at verse 1. Again, this is Paul talking to a young pastor. I almost feel like Paul is talking to me. He's talking to you, Eugene. David, you're not a pastor. He's talking to you too because you know something. Brian, he's talking to you. Joey's talking to you. Kevin, he's even talking to you. Karen, he's talking to you too. If you're going to do anything, he says, I charge you before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who shall judge the quick or living in the dead and his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. When he says preach the word, what do you think he's talking about? Well, he's talking about the scriptures because the verse prior to that says all scripture is given by inspiration of God. When he's talking about the scriptures, he's talking about the Bible. So he says preach the word or preach the scriptures. Be instant, in season or out of season, or do it whether it's convenient or not. Uh, be, uh, be diligent, or be instant, in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. Now this is a perfect portrait of the church today. Paul said this over 2,000 years ago, and it's almost like he said it last week. He says they won't endure sound doctrine, but after their own passions and desires, you should be reading, I just know this, because of their own lust, they shall heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn, their, turn away their ears from the truth, and they shall be turned unto fables. Now the word fables is interesting. A fable is that which is delivered by word of mouth. It's just somebody says something, and it carries down, and it carries down, and it carries down, and there's no basis for it. Christians believe so many weird things today. I mean, I remember I used to have this job, and this lady told me, she says, yeah, my dog prays in tongues. <laughs> what? <laughs> my dog, he's praying in spirit. <laughs> See, now we laugh at that, but I could show you hundreds and hundreds of people that are like that. And yet, we're doing the exact same, the exact opposite of what God wants us to do. He doesn't want us... By the way, how many of you have heard of the fruits of the Spirit? One of the fruits of the Spirit is not gullibility or naivete. Amen. And so many Christians are so naive, I know why the rapture is going to come before the tribulation. If God did snatch us out of here, the Antichrist would get all of us. A lot of us. Because we buy it. Because we don't have any knowledge. Now again, is this a rebuke? No, it's an encouragement. Start getting the Bible. Don't just come to Ladera Christian Fellowship. Ladera Christian Fellowship might last a year. It might last 220 years. It might last two weeks. This is going to last. This is, should be your foundation. Let's look at another passage of Scripture where God, Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 4, where God is encouraging Christians to not, don't be so gullible. If you had some brains, you wouldn't, I mean biblical brains, you wouldn't fall prey to all of these little gimmicks and things. I mean, should I say this, Lord? I don't know if I can say it. Should I say it? When a man gets on television and says, or through print or whatever, and says, if y'all don't send me $8 million, God is going to take my life. You. <laughs> I know you meant that, in, and he meant that, and he meant that in a loving way. Because there are worse things than death. That's stealing from God's people, using extortion. You ought to be biblically smart enough to be able to see that it's extortion. I mean, God isn't going to hold you ransom because you can't raise five million dollars. 
I mean, and the, the funny thing about it is, there are a lot of people who are not Christians, they already are that smart. Amen. They wouldn't fall for that. And then when they see us falling for it, they say, you're a moron. How am I going to follow you? Right. <laughs> you don't have enough sense to see extortion when it's staring you in the face. And see, God sent people who are pastors and teachers to keep us from that kind of stuff. Just because someone says that they're the anointed of God, does that make it so? But for most Christians, you'll get in a fight with some of them. When you'll say, no, this brother, he's not, he's not right on me. Well, no, he says, touch thou not thine anointed of the Lord. You don't even want to hear my response to that. How many of you know where that scripture is? How many of you know what it means? See, most of us don't. If you knew what it meant, when the Bible says, Touch thou not the anointed of God, you know who he's referring to? He's referring to Diane. He's referring to Kelly. He's referring to Tanya. He's referring to Lori. He's referring to Deanna. Don't touch my children. Don't touch my kids. Don't mess with my kids. These guys who are in leadership, they want to keep going on in their error, and they'll make the statement, You're coming against God's anointing. If you're coming against God's people, you're coming against God's people. Okay, did I say turn to Ephesians chapter 4? The very reason why God put ministry gifts into the church, and this is why another ministry. I'm still answering the question. The world is in crisis. The church is in crisis. Christianity is in crisis. And the reason why Christianity is in crisis is because too few leaders are doing what God said. He said here in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. This is after Jesus ascended into heaven. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come into the unity of the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect or mature man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth, or that we no more, be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men. You know what the word in the Greek means, slight? Anybody ever been fishing? Deception. Deception, slight. It's almost, but the word, the, the Greek origin in the word, is like bait and switch. It's a deceptive device. Through the slight of men and cunning craftiness by which they lie in wait to deceive. There, there are no deceivers today. Why do you think Jesus made the statement? I mean, I believe Jesus loves us. I believe he loves us. And I believe when Jesus made this statement over 2,000 years ago, he saw the world where it's going to be today. And you know what he said? He said, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. The problem with most of us, because we don't have biblical knowledge, we can't tell if they're a false prophet or not. Because they dress up what they do in Christian talk. It's called God talk. They use all the right phrases. They associate with all the right people. When you see their program on television and they have a nice prayer tower and they're sitting and they're so humble and they're saying, I'm going to take your prayer request. But make sure while I'm doing it, you send me a thousand dollar vow. Because I like thousand dollar vows. As if you've got to pay God to get your prayer answered. See, if you knew the Bible, you would know that you couldn't pay God to get your prayer answered. But yet, don't, don't laugh. This particular person that I'm referring to just quit his ministry. Hallelujah, I say. Why do I say hallelujah? Oh, you said wow. Because if she was saying, why do I say hallelujah? Because at least there's, there are those many less people that will be to see. When you're asking for vows and that I'll pray for you and that the money gets into the bank but the prayers get into the trash can, there's a problem. And Christians are so gullible. I mean, I watch some of these people that do these things and they get caught red-handed. What's that program that comes up, tell us? That Channel 9. Crime? Crime? Nine, current Affair or something? It's a shame that we are so naive that we have to let the world tell us what's happening in the church. We should be able to do that. I remember a guy got up there, lost his home, and he got up there and he put on, you know, he usually has on a suit, he came on with some clothes, just, you know, shoddy clothes, and he says, he and his wife, we lost everything. They had another house. Another million dollar house. And he's right back on television. And people are sending him money. 
I want to say, some of you need a lobotomy. You need a brain transplant. I mean, when someone is caught in deception, you don't just keep sending people money who are deceiving people, do you? I mean, if all of a sudden the Derek Christian Fellowship starts growing, I drive a, a Volkswagen Jetta, so maybe you shouldn't hear me because I don't drive. Oh, I'm not being the same. Um, <laughs> too late? Okay. But I drive a kind of a mediocre car. What if all of a sudden this church car starts growing, the next thing you know, you see me pulling up in a Rolls Royce? Are you going to have a question about that? <laughs> if you don't, you should. Now, there might be a legitimate answer. I have my own business and things by the good. But we are we have decided, Gene and Joe and myself, we have decided to account for every penny that comes to the church. And I guarantee you that it's not going for me or them. It's going for the serving of people. And that's the answer to the last question. Why another ministry? Because we don't have enough people who want to serve. See, a lot of people want to get into the ministry. While I'm talking, turn to Matthew chapter 20. A lot of people want to get into ministry. But they don't really know what ministry is, because if they did, they wouldn't want to get into it. I'm not here this morning because this is a life dream that I get a chance to talk in front of people. In my business, I talk in front of more people than this when I'm talking about insurance. This is a small group to me. So it's not like I like to hear myself talk or I just want to talk in front of a lot of people. That's not why. I'm in ministry because I love you if you're a Christian. And if you're not a Christian, I love you too. See, I want to be in ministry what Christ said about ministry. You know what the, the definition of minister is in the Bible? Joe, you can't answer this question. Anybody know? Take a guess. A servant. A person who serves another person. We belittle servanthood in our society. Black people, especially because we were slaves. I, I just want to say this. Slavery was not servanthood. There is a big difference between being a servant and being someone's slave like we were treated in this country. But we belittled servanthood. And Jesus made a statement. Well, I'm not gonna get, I'm not gonna tell you yet. But the definition of a minister is one who renders service to another. The root word in the Greek literally means a person that waits on tables. And the root word carries the connotation that one that runs to serve another person like, can I help you? Have you ever seen a waiter? You've been in a restaurant that's busy? Can I help you? What do you need? Can I help you? What do you need? Yes, can I take your order, please? Hold. That's what a minister is supposed to do. Amen. He's supposed to be there. Guys, I hear guys bragging. Oh no, man, I don't have time for them people. Then you need to get out of the ministry. Amen. I used to go to a church and the pastor said, God didn't call me to counsel. He didn't call you to the ministry. No. If you don't have time to deal with people's lives, you need to get out. Go be an actor. If you're a good actor, do that. But if you can't take time for people, and I'm not just ministers, you too. You that are Christians, boy, I'm going to tell you something. The world is looking to be served. They're looking for someone to come out and serve them and help them. And you don't serve them like this. Let me tell you about Jesus, you right. dumb bunny. Right. You don't do that. <laughs> I, I would get right. No, don't worry. I would get right. Right? Okay. <laughs> but if you go out to someone and just the, the natural reaction, if you're coming and hammering them overhead, telling them what you haven't done and what you're not. And wait a minute. That's where you and I were just a few years ago. But if I say, come, I want to show you Christ. I love you, brother. I want to show you Christ. I really didn't have to pull him up. That's what we're supposed to do. That's what God has called all of us to do, not just ministers. Okay, Matthew 20. I'm going to try to close. How much time do I have on that tape, Randy? I, I, I can keep going. Some of these folks want to go home and watch the chain. Me too. <laughs> I, I love being free. It's so good to be free. It's so good to be able to be honest with yourself and Jesus. I like my buddy Kevin said, Charlie, when you get into something, you get into it. If it's football, I get into it. But if it's the Word of God, I get into it. And I put the Word of God first. But when the Word of God is over and if nobody needs me for the rest of the day, you know what I'm going to be doing. Okay, Matthew 20. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 20. Becoming one of my favorite passages of Scripture if I can find it. 
Mm-hmm. Yes, let's start at the 25th verse. Give you a little background. There were two of Jesus' disciples that just asked him if they could sit on his right hand and on his left hand in his head. And Jesus said, wait a minute, are you able to drink from the cup that I can drink from? Are you ready to go through what I can go through? And they said, yes, we are. And he says, yes, you will do my cup. And he says, you will do what I'm doing in some respects. He says, but who's going to sit on my right hand or on my left hand? That's for my father to give. And the other disciples got angry. They said, who do you guys think you are? Why do you want the chief place? So they got angry. And Jesus, he responded this way in the 25th verse. But Jesus called them unto him said, unto him and said, you know that the princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them. And they that are great exercise authority over them. Transmodern translation. In our society, the great people are over the rest of us. They kind of rule us and run us. They may not run you personally, but they're fooling with the monetary system. You know, they're creating some of the problems that we're having in the economy. Like Mr. M.M. won't even mention his name. But because of him, many companies went under because of his greed. And he can, he's, he's, a, he's an ex-convict that he can go places that I can't go. I've never been in jail. So Jesus says, you know that the princes of the Gentiles, follow along with me, exercise dominion over them, and they that exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you. I don't want you to have the world's mentality. Jesus says this about Christians. But whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister or your servant. See, you want to be great? How many of you want to be great? You better get your waiter clothes on. Get your servant clothes on. Because that's what's going to win the world. Serving the world. Serving one another. He says this. Whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. You know, I like the way Martin Luther King put it. Martin Luther King had a lot to say that you never hear about. His last message was called Drum Major Instinct. And you know, you know how he ended it? This is like his last sermon at his church that he pastored. He says, you know, everybody can be great because everybody can serve. Jesus said the requirement for greatness is servanthood. I think a lot of guys in ministry got it backwards. They want to be served. I mean, why, why do we have to buy you a new car? Just I'm the man of God. I should have a nice car. Why? What does, what does it have to do with anything? Now, some of us laugh, but you know something on a serious note? That's why some people won't come to Christ. Because they're saying, wait a minute, oh, I, ain't giving my, I ain't giving that preacher my money. Now, that's not true in all cases, because there's some preachers that, you know, they're very, very above board. But in some cases, they're right. We should never give them a place to think that. Matter of fact, let's look at this uh, passage in Matthew chapter 23. And I'm going to give you a quick picture. We'll, we'll read this, go back to Matthew 20, and we'll close the 28th verse. We're going to read 23 real quick, and we're going to start at uh, the 13th verse. See, what we have today, and why why another ministry? We don't have enough servants. We have too many Pharisees. Modern day Pharisees. You know what the Pharisees were? Anybody know? They were the religious leaders of Jesus' day. And they loved, well, let's read it. Let's look at verse 13. But woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites. For you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men, for you neither go in yourselves, neither allow them to, who are entering to go in. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. By the way, I want you to, you know who's saying this? This is love incarnate saying this. This is God manifested in the flesh saying this. He says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. For you devour widows' houses and for pretense make long prayer. Therefore, you shall receive the greater. Uh, damnation. I want to go back up, excuse me, to 23 verse uh, 1. Go back up to the first verse. Then spoke Jesus to the multitude and said to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees 
sit at Moses' seat. All therefore, whatever they bid you observe, that observe and do, but don't do after their works, for they say, don't do as I do, do as I say do. Anybody ever heard that? You're supposed to be the example. For they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be born and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves do not move them with one of their fingers. But all their works they do to be seen of men. What's your motivation? If your motivation for service is just so you can be seen, you're missing the point. We should want to serve God for this reason. In a nutshell. When we disobey God, and we went away from God, God sent His Son into the world to die for us. That should be enough. Shouldn't it? I mean, when you think about it, you don't appreciate it now. But the next time you go to a funeral and you see somebody in a casket, you start thinking about what if that was me. The best news in the world is that you have eternal life. God, if God gave you 50 Rolls Royces tomorrow, it can't top what He's already done. Amen. So that ought to induce us to want to serve Him. That's why I'm so gracious. I mean, I walk around and I look at the world. I mean, you know, you see people dropping like flies. I mean, there's, there's no... Can't, you're not safe anywhere. And I just know I have eternal life. Reading on. Um... Verse 5, But all their works they do to be seen of men. They may draw their phylacteries and enlarge the borders of their garments and love the uttermost places at the feasts and the chief seats in the synagogues and greetings in the marketplaces. And they love to be called Master, Master, Rabbi, Rabbi, or Doctor, Doctor. That's what they call today. I'm Doctor so-and-so. As if the, the fact that someone gave you an honorary PhD means something. What does that mean? And even if you're the smartest person in the world, if you're not serving people, I'll miss the point. You're not going to be rewarded by Christ. I, I was talking to a guy at this meeting. He said, oh, why don't you come to our seminary? Because if you've been in ministry for five years, you can go for our master's degree and get a doctor. I said, I'm not even taking this class for credit. What difference does it make if I get credit for... You mean if I don't get an A or... I mean, if I don't get credit from some seminary, I didn't learn anything? I don't care about a master's degree or a doctor. You say, but, but it opened the door. People will listen to you. Hey, if you if I need to have doctor before my name, before you listen to me, you don't have to listen to me. So he says, they learn to be called rabbi, rabbi, or master, master, but this is what Jesus says. But be not ye called rabbi, for there is one master, even Christ. And all you are brethren. And let me set the foundation for the Dare Christian Fellowship. There is nobody that's higher than anybody else in this church. Fellowship. Can you say amen to that? Because people, I'll just correct you nicely. Hey! Because I used to go to church and this used to just like bug me. I used to go to this church and the pastor's last name was Price. They said, you're over there with Christ. No, I'm over there with Christ. That's who died. Then I went to another church and said, Who's, the pastor's name was Billy. You over there with Billy? No, I'm over there with Jesus. And if Jesus leaves, I leave. So everybody, we're all brethren. We're all the same. We're all one. This is our fellowship. If you plan on attending Ladera, this is your fellowship. Not mine. Because I haven't had to share any blood for it. And even if I did, it would be sin. sinning blood. <laughs> Wouldn't do you any good. Okay. Verse 9. And call no man your father upon the earth, for you have one father who is in heaven. I don't mean to step on toes if you have a Catholic background, but when they see those guys, I don't call them father. For what? They're not my father. They're not my spiritual father. I have one spiritual father. His name is God. Neither be ye called masters. For one is your master, even Christ. But he that is the greatest among you, let him be your... And whosoever shall exalt himself shall be... And whosoever shall humble himself shall be... So God says, just humble yourself. Just be a servant. You know who you'd be following if you're being a servant? Real quickly, turn to Philippians chapter 2. That's exactly what Jesus did. Are you better than Jesus? 
Does anybody in here measure Jesus? No. If you are, I just want to, I got there, there's a pool out there, I just want to see you walk on water. <laughs> If you're, if you're better than Jesus, you ought to be able to do what Jesus can do. And he walked on water. Philippians chapter 2, verse 7, real quick. <clears throat> it says, speaking of Jesus, if you read the context, when, when I give a verse, Philippians 2, 7, you should write that down and go home and read Philippians chapter 2, the whole chapter. Now, I know some of you are going to do it, but I'm going to keep encouraging you to do it. Because one of these days it's going to catch up. Right, Eugene? Philippians 2, 7. But made himself no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant. To, but made himself, speaking of Christ, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant. You want to be in ministry? You want to? You want to follow Jesus? You'll be a servant. Let's close with this verse. I, I really will close with this verse. I know I said that about three times. I get excited about the word. Is that okay? Amen. If I get excited about the Cowboys, I can get excited about Jesus. Because you know, the Cowboys won the Super Bowl last year, right? Yeah. Guess what they gave me after they won? Yeah. <laughs> Nada. I didn't even get a postcard. I didn't even get a... We did it, Charlton! <laughs> I did get a hat from my friends, the Luzans, the Dallas Cowboys. That's it. And, and I could tease Brian. Okay, Matthew 20. We can get excited about football and we can get excited ladies about clothes and things and get excited about Christ. Because part of the reason why I think a lot of people are not convinced that Christ is real is because we're not very convinced that he's real. Because if we really felt that what Jesus did for us we'd be a little bit more excited about it. Okay, Matthew 20, verse 28. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto or not to be ministered unto or not to be served but to minister or serve and give his life a ransom for me. That's who I want to follow. That's who I'm going to follow. And I encourage you to follow him too. I encourage you as we get the Derek Christian Fellowship started. You know, people are saying, well, are we going to have more people? Is the church going to grow? If you don't grow, there's no need in the church grow. What's the purpose in having more people? You just have a, another group, and I don't, and I mean this respectfully, respectfully but you have a, another group of 5,000 ignorant people that are not growing. It's never been quantity. It's always quality. So if I could just kind of share with you and get you in the mode of wanting to serve, we'll win more people by serving than we'll win by preaching. Because when you're just preaching, sometimes it's just you against them. And if they're one of your peers, they can say, well, what do you know more than I know? But if you just start serving them and showing them the love of Christ and being like Christ, who didn't come to be served, but to serve and give his life. Every head bowed, every eye closed, to be a very important part of the service. He gave his life. He served all the way to the cross for you. Some of you know this already, some of you don't. And just for the courtesy of other people, just if everybody would have their heads bowed and their eyes closed, just, we're going to be finishing in about five minutes. I want to give you an opportunity. I don't want to say it. If you've never invited Christ into your life, a good sermon doesn't mean anything. It's very important that you take advantage of this ransom that Christ paid for you. When someone pays a ransom, it means that someone has been kidnapped or they're in bondage. And we all were in bondage before Christ came and died for us. This is what church is about. This is what life is about. Where men and women, boys and girls, are in the valley of decision, trying to decide whether or not this thing about Jesus is true. So, while every head is bowed and every eye is closed, if you would say, you know, I've never invited Christ into my life, but I'd like to. I want to have Jesus in my life today. This is between you and God. Nobody else is looking. The only person that has their eyes open is me. And it's a decision that you will make between you and God. Don't worry about what people will think. What are they going to think if you die outside of Christ? What do you do? I really just want to encourage you that Jesus loves you. He died for your sins. So if you would say, just by 
looking up at you. You don't even have to raise your hand. You just look up at me and say, yes, I want to invite Christ into my life today. We'll acknowledge that. Here's anybody. Or if you happen to be a person that says, you know, I'm really not sure where I am with God. I, I don't know. And I want to be sure. I want to say this to you in a loving way. Don't play with it. Everybody says, I'll wait till tomorrow. Whoever who told you you were going to be here tomorrow. You don't know for sure. So, if you would look up at me, if you want to invite Christ, or if you want to be sure that you know Christ, just look up at me. I'll just wait a second. Probably most of you in here today have already begun your life with Christ. But I never want to assume. Okay, let's just close with prayer. Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for your word. Lord, we praise you and thank you that the Derek Christian Fellowship, as Joe very appropriately put it, has started. We've only started. It's the first step. We have many, many steps. We invite you into our fellowship, Father, to be the head of our fellowship. You're the head. We're the head. We praise you and thank you.